Hello, friends. This is a, a great group to be presenting to. You seem to all speak our language, and we really appreciate that. I'm Bill Funkhauser, one of the coordinators of a arts and, integration, arts and education model development and dissemination grant up uh, in the Eureka area, uh, Humboldt County. And I'm Heather Guerra, um, working on this project as well. So we're working with about 100 teachers, uh, a couple thousand students. We're in classrooms, we're creating curriculum, we're uh, developing curriculum, we're coaching uh, teachers as well. We're about halfway through a four-year uh, AEMDD grant, uh, in working in eight schools. We're working in math, language arts, science, and social studies. Most of the projects that we do are visual art and theater. There are some music and dance projects as well. So one of the essential questions of this convening is how is arts integration interpreted and that's one of the things we're going to bring to you the way that we interpret it and practice it in our area. I think Danielle did a great job uh, framing this uh, our presentation of uh, putting the students uh, at the center of the conversation and that's what our presentation is going to do as well. So let's start with the story about a student. This is JC and JC uh, started the year according to his teacher pretty pretty depressed pretty despondent. Um, he, uh, he seemed uh, almost hostile at times, according to his teacher. When he was asked to do work, he was very quiet in class. He didn't want to share what was going on uh, in, in his life. When we started this mass project with JC, he really came alive. He started working on the project outside of class. He was more than willing to share his thoughts, his deep symbolism that he was using for his uh, mask with the rest of the class. And um, this is the mask that he made here. And you'll see that some parts of the mask are breaking away. He was talking about his grandmother and uh, she was breaking through. Unfortunately, she was breaking through uh, into the afterlife. She had died and the horn symbolized how she was strong like a bull holding the family together and the blue was the sadness that JC felt. And as Danielle said, uh, you can't think when your heart is broken. And I think that that uh, kind of sums up where JC was coming from, but uh, he himself was sort of breaking free. And his teacher said that he was a, a much more engaged student after this project, willing to share, willing to talk, willing to participate in class. So our most recent work has been at Zane Middle School in Eureka, where we've been doing this mask project. Here's a snapshot of the demographics. So you can take a look at that. We are a very rural community. If you've ever been up to Eureka in the Humboldt County area, that's where we are at the little red dot. <laughs> and then we also work at, uh, on the Hoopaw Reservation, Native American school, 96%. Um, I know that Sandy's been there. And um, we were doing our mask project up there, and we're working with teachers in that district as well. And that is extremely rural. <laughs> so the MASK project is uh, to show transformational personal narrative, some sort of transformational event through a MASK. And as we know, personal narrative is describing an experience in a, in a person's life. And we tie our projects to the common core standards. That's a perspective that I bring as a classroom teacher who's rooted in having to address standards. But uh, we were working with writing narratives from this common core standard in addition to figurative and connotative meanings in the reading and literacy standards. And um, this is part of the language that we use to get the buy-in from our administrators and our teachers who still feel that pressure of having to address and work within the standards. From the VAPA standards, we were using the figurative language and imagery, symbolism, and designing and creating masks from the theater standards. We tried to put uh, masks into a historical and cultural context. These masks come from Alaska, Canada, Puerto Rico, Java. What are masks used for? We talked about how they're used for disguise, for uh, protection, uh, for entertainment, and uh, putting it into a context so that they realize that we, uh, you know, there's a time and place for masks throughout history. But for this project, this was the concept, that the outside of the mask would be the public symbols of the narrative, what everybody saw going on in that narrative. But inside would be the private, the more personal symbolism that only they were thinking about or feeling inside the mask. We wanted them to really think like more advanced artists, so we wanted them to move away from cliche. We wanted to take an idea like peace or peaceful and have them think, 
what are the common symbols that everybody use? You know, what, what are the cliche, the obvious, the overused symbols? And how can you move to a more personal symbol, something that comes from your history, something from your memory, something that's really your story? So maybe uh, that's a more appropriate symbol for peacefulness in your life. And what we're finding is that as students expand their capacity for abstract thought, when they went through this exercise, we heard them talk about art that they would view and be able to interpret it in a different way and wonder, what does that symbolize? So it was a really interesting experience watching students go through this process. We also wanted students to think like an artist. If you want to have a message of something that's calm and supportive in your life, what choices are you going to make for the shape, the line, the form, the texture, the color? Think like an artist. How does an artist convey those sorts of, that sort of meaning in the art that they do? What value is it going to have? Is it large? Is it small? Is it a big part of your life or a small part of your life? And then sketching your symbol to get them beyond what they might normally do as a you know, first draft and a first iteration. Oh, and one thing I was going to mention back at the standards slide, students with their language arts teachers went through the process of writing their personal narrative first. Then they moved into creating the mask. And then after the mask project, they went into writing their artist statement reflecting on the process that they had gone through. So it was that whole arch of that process that was involved. So we do have uh, teaching artists that come into the classroom uh, and uh, teach the cardboard skills, the paper mache skills, the painting skills, all the skills that they would need to uh, learn how to make their masks. And then we um, watched as they went through iterations in creating their masks. These are some examples of what came of that project. This is difficult to see, but the, um, this student actually cut a basketball in half, recessed a mask inside, and that's showing, this part here is showing what's the, the mask from the inside. And what was, this is her representation of what was going on on the inside during her transformative event. And this mask went through multiple iterations of, she changed, she changed this mask many times as she created it. I was just reading last night the, uh, the student on the right and how uh, there's this one fish that's, that's going the other way. Everybody else is going in one direction and they are different and they are going another way. And, and she was thinking deeply about, about what it's like to be that fish. I know this student was thinking about his independence. And when he got a bike, he was uh, more independent after he had the bike. And he was trying to think about symbols that would represent uh, uh, independence. And he'd just uh, been really interested in Hamilton and the founding fathers. And uh, so the, uh, the, the flag to represent independence was his way of saying, you know, that's me now. And that is the inside, isn't it, yes. Heather? Yeah, that's yeah. the inside on the right. The outside and the inside of that mask, yeah. So then the masks were exhibited in Eureka in the Arts Alive uh, event in a coffee house in this case. And since uh, we were tasked with uh, putting the student's voice uh, at the center of our conversation here, I think you might enjoy this uh, video, which actually has the student's words as the narrative. So first I had to write an autobiographical narrative, and then I had to think about symbolism and how I was going to bring that narrative out into the physical form of the mask. This assignment is difficult and challenging for me because I prefer to be told what to do and exactly how to do it. But instead with this project, it pushes my boundaries by making me do what I want to do instead of being told what to do. We had to write about our narrative, but then we had to put it into a mask. And I was just totally blindsided by that because I'd never really been able to represent words with objects. And that was a huge, that's a huge difficulty. And this project is really showing me how one word can mean, can represent something that you never thought it could in like an object. So the autobiographical narrative was really literal in exactly what we felt. But with the mass project, we can have so many metaphors that other people may not be able to understand. 
like a tree can represent you growing and like concrete can represent you being held back and I just really feel that the mass project is helping us understand metaphors and how we can use things to show what we're meaning but, but it may not be so noticeable to other people. This project is different because it's really asking you about this event in your life that created who you are now. That's never really been done, well at least when I'm in school. And I thought that really like kind of touches down on you. Like, huh, you really gotta think. You can't just be just a simple project and do, go through your normal routine of processing it. You gotta really think about what happened and how this changed you. It's different. It's not what you usually do. So I like stepping out of my comfort zone and, and trying new things like that. If I got to do this in all of my classes, I feel like I would get a better understanding of the curriculum because art is, is another way for me to understand rather, rather than just writing on paper. I think the experience of the mask is a really important part of actually learning the subject because when I started doing my narrative, um, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do. And then I get the mask project and suddenly it's like, how do I symbolize what I did? How do, how does it, how do I expand my horizons as to what I'm really taking in and learning? And if I could have that experience every day, it would actually really open up the subject matter. I, I already understand it, but I don't really connect with it. It's just like Confucius said, here I forget, see I remember, and involve me I learn. So we were talking earlier about the, uh, uh, the Kennedy Center definition for the arts integration, uh, and we use this quite a bit. As a matter of fact, uh, we have improved upon and, and added to a 12-point checklist modified from the Kennedy Center definition. And there's, uh, as I said, 12 points here, and we find that projects that score about eight or more of these 12 points are usually a really good sign that that's a strong arts integration project. So Danielle was asking us, how do we measure this? How do we measure arts integration? And this is one way that we measure it. We use it when we're creating a new project or when we're evaluating an existing project. So if it's okay with you, I was gonna show you a few of the ideas that are in this checklist. Probably the biggest one is, are the students constructing and demonstrating understanding through one or more of the arts? And as uh, Callie said, the mask project is helping me understand metaphors and how I can show what I'm meaning. That was in the video. And then this one is about the artworks being original. So as you saw in the, mas in the examples of the masks, very diverse products and everybody was expressing in their own way. Also, are students creatively solving problems as opposed to completing a set of instructions like we do when we are in more of a craft project? Did you hear what Jack said when he said, you really have to think, you can't just do your regular school routine. I just love that. Our students using the design process. So this is something that we're also emphasizing across subject areas, that this is a practice that we do in science, where we come up with a question, and we, come, we try to solve the problem, and then we evaluate that, we reflect and we revise and we come up with a new question. This is a really important thinking process in science, additionally in writing. In the writing process, we plan, we revise, we edit, we rewrite. These are things that artists do and scientists do and people in all different curricular areas are doing. Does it connect to grade level content standards to art forms in a way that makes sense? So in this case, we were looking at the theater standards of, of uh, figurative language and imagery with the uh, literacy standards of figurative language. Made a lot of sense to connect those. And then do students reflect on their understanding, either verbally or in writing? So we use the Studio Habits of Mind sentence frames or sentence stems and offer students an opportunity to reflect on that process. So when I had difficulty with blank, I solved the problem by blank. That's a process thinking. 
um, we have them, we provide these frames for them and they, they use them. Do they evaluate their accomplishment and receive feedback, not just from the teacher, but from others as well? And we find that uh, starting any project with a rubric ahead of time, what is it that you're trying to teach and how are you going to assess those things? So this is the uh, upper left corner of the rubric for the mask project. So part of our grant has to do with collecting data on engagement levels. And this was challenging because we first had to step back and define what engagement meant. We did a lot of research on what engagement means. And we developed a tool for how to measure what students are doing in the classroom without being able to interview them. So it had to be an objective survey of the class within a 20 minute classroom visit. So we, we broke up engagement levels into five levels. The first level is uh, often easy to see, and that's the disruptive level, keeping other students from learning. The second level is distracted or disengaged, looking out the window, head down, that sort of level. The third level, receptive. You're all showing me receptive level right now, sitting, you know, watching. Compliant. Yeah. It's what happens in whole group instruction, and this is a very common and, and effective way for teachers who are trying to manage 30 kids at a time I'm giving whole group instruction, I might ask a question and call on one student, okay? Mm -hmm. And that would be most 29 students in the room would be at receptive, and then the one student who answers the question would be at active engagement. So active engagement is when you're actually doing something. You're writing a sentence, you're solving a math problem, whatever. And the final level is what we call creative level. And this, uh, this level is when you're showing in your own way. So maybe that's a, how did you solve the math problem? Well, I thought about it like this. That could be an example of the creative level. Or if we said, uh, what would be another example of showing your own way, Heather? Well, if you observe natural phenomenon, for example, of spiders and how they move and how they create webs, and then you ask students, you've given them some theater skills, perhaps, and you ask them to interpret how spiders move and act when they're spinning a web, and they do it in their own way, that would be creative engagement, as opposed to everybody do exactly this, you know, or something like that. So we talked to teachers about what they thought their levels were, and, and there's the, also that there's a balance. We, we are not striving to have level five all the time. Certainly it's appropriate to be in some of these other modes, but we're hoping to increase level five engagement with arts integration. So we had over 5,400 student points of observation, and the blue is the baseline. So you'll notice in the passive level, about 50% of the time students are in that sitting, receptive, compliant mode. And then it tapers off on either end. You know, um, the disruptive, pretty small, the creative, pretty small, a fair amount of active, you know, doing something in the classroom. But then when you move to something like the mask project, our data indicated, at least this initial data showed, uh, wow, look at what happened to the creative level. A lot more of that going on. So this is our kind of first initial data collection that's uh, being conducted through our principal investigator at Humboldt State University. The, the essential question of this convening, how is arts integration interpreted? And this is one of the ways that we're doing it with our project across the different contexts, ways that we measure what we're trying to do. Uh, we have the 12 point checklist and rubrics. Um, all of that is available on our website, artsintegration.net. Our initial uh, observation data is showing the increased engagement during the arts integration. I think you preach preaching to the choir here. I think you probably already know that. And, and we're finding more yeah. and more that the arts do in fact support Common Core and that Common Core can support the arts and we're trying to bridge that gap for our administrators and people who may not be um, arts educators so that they can come on board with us in this work. So that's our website and thank you. <laughs>